Hi, and welcome to this Big Data Intro webinar. My name is uh, Veronica Lundbe. I'm the marketing manager in Base Farm Sweden, uh, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. At first, <clears throat> I have some practical things before we begin. As you probably already noticed, uh, you're muted during the webinar. If you have any questions or comments, submit the question via the questions pane that you see probably on your right side. Klaus will answer your questions in the end of the webinar. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, let us know via the question function in this webinar or send an email to me. Uh, and you do that to veronica.lundbe at basefarm.com. This presentation is in English since we are, have participants from different countries. And also note that today's presentation is being recorded and will be published on basefarm.com. After this webinar, you will get the link to the recording in an email. Now we're moving on to some facts about Basefarm. For those of you who doesn't know Basefarm, we are a European managed service provider. We help our customers with cloud transformation and management, big data, information security, and operation of mission critical services. We deliver value through the service lifecycle from innovation to production, combining traditional best practice with modern service models. <clears throat> We understand the challenges of many different industries and markets since we operate in five countries. And we have helped many companies and organizations with their digital transformation and turning data into business. Here you can see some of the companies that we work with. And that's all from me. And now it's time for class in Germany to take us into the magical world of big data. So I hand over to you. Thank you very much and a big welcome. My name is Klaas. I work as a chief evangelist at Unbelievable Machine, which is part of Base Farm Group. Um, I was one of the first chief data scientists over here in Germany and the German speaking market. And not just um, into chief, uh, <laughs> into, chief uh, into data science, um, but also into something we call data thinking, which is a strategic framework to enable companies in this world of data and artificial intelligence and all related technologies. Um, I deeply believe that um, AI and by that big data uh, will change our world. Um, I'm quite sure, but let's say hopefully for the better. And um, I say about myself that I'm a kind of a foresight and backward thinker, so I I try to cross bridges to every kind of idea and every kind of team, let's say, and skill set and create something out of it. So somewhere between, let's say, disruption, because everybody talks about it, and artificial intelligence, what's really happening out there at the moment everywhere is that we are surrounded by data realities. That's how I call it. They are not looking like virtual reality right now, but they look like something we already know. So we have new data realities in our industries, in our buildings, in our production chains, in our cities, in transportation, in logistics, in the whole supply chain and everything we actually do right now in the analog world mainly, there will be new data, let's say digital reality soon. We have to create, we have to design, we have to enable ourselves and create value out of it. Same goes with cars. We all heard about autonomous cars. They are actually driven by data and they are driven by AI, or let's say machine learning, but I'll come to that later. And of course, we have a lot of data realities at every interface of our organization to our clients, of ourselves to our digital devices, to new devices like maybe Siri or Amazon Echo or whatever kind of device will be out there 
in the future. It's all something that will change our reality and our understanding of it and how we need to design them. And those realities, they are filled with magic. Well, at least that's what some people say. Of course, it's not magic, it's mathematics. But since primary school, for a lot of people, that's the same, to be honest. And you know what I mean. But of course, everything into artificial intelligence, machine learning, and how we deal with data today, even if we talk about, let's say, advanced or predictive analytics, it's mainly mathematics. So it's mathematical functions operating on data to create an output that I, in the ideal world will support or automate decisions and run our business operations. Right now, these algorithms that run on our data are based on a lot and a huge amount of data and they're based on what we in IT call brute force. So it's really a huge amount of resources, CPU power, data power, data management to actually run these kind of services. That might change soon. And they are based on best guess. Everything we do now in advanced analytics, machine learning, whatever is in the probability space is it's about statistics so we don't have a clear zero or one to decide on we always have something in between and we as teams as individuals and as organizations need to learn how to deal with probabilities in the future sometimes it feels like magic and that's for example if you look at this example from Google, there was an algorithm trained to create subtitles for images. So the subtitles you see were not generated by humans, but by a machine. And they are awesome. On the top left side, you see a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. And there was an algorithm analyzing only the picture and describing it in text. Quite amazing. And a lot of of these examples work quite well there are some that don't at the let's say bottom right a fridge filled with lots of foods and drinks well not perfect but after a couple of beers we'd probably say the same and this is what i mean with probabilities and that we need to learn about and that we need to understand this other example skype and microsoft research are able to translate human speech in real time it's the same that google with their google buds kind of an ear plug or earphone that they presented are um, producing right now what does it mean well maybe in the future we don't need to learn languages anymore we just have a our smartphone or any kind of device that translates any language into our in real time and that will change the world and we all, of course, heard about Go, that machines are capable of playing Go better than humans are. Honestly, not very impressive because Go is not what you really need uh, to, let's say, survive in our world or in any kind of world, if it's analog or digital. But it's still quite amazing. And one thing, for example, is that researchers believe that it will take another 10 years to actually beat humans in the game of Go. It didn't. And that just states how fast things are moving right now in the field of big data and AI, and that we don't have any idea now what will be in this field and what kind of products we might be able to build or to buy in, let's say, 12 or 24 months. Why that? We live in an AI summer. There's on Wikipedia something called AI winter, and uh, that's just the time in the 80s and 90s which just didn't work. So we did a lot of research on artificial intelligence and alike, and it, and it just didn't really work. The results weren't very impressive and we couldn't build something out of it. But that changed. Why does it change? Well, we have the data, 
That's where all the big players like Google and the like are uh, at the forefront of AI research right now because they own a lot of data that you need to train and optimize any kind of algorithm and model right now. You, we have the power of machines, as already stated, brute force. We have cloud computing, we have scalable computing, distributed computing, whatever you want to call it. A lot of it is open source and we have an unbelievable amount of resources ready to crunch data and then add to that the capabilities of algorithms, which honestly are a lot of things we talk about right now, 40 or 50 years old. So even that what's nowadays called artificial intelligence or deep learning, the algorithms behind are pretty, pretty old. Um, it's just the amount of data and the amount of uh, CPU power or GPU power that you add to it that makes them really work and create something that I'd call, a lot of others call, a superhuman pattern recognition. So they are, they are able to, 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 to learn from patterns, to see patterns in any amount of data and by that create new things. That was a kind of introduction. Let's come to big data now. So what is big data? A lot of things. It's honestly just a word uh, that we use um, to, let's say, share our knowledge and experience about anything that's data today. If we look at Wikipedia, it says, big data is a term for data sets that are so large or complex that traditional data processing application software is inadequate to deal with them. That means, of course, volume of data is one of the main criteria to classify big data. But it's only one. There are others from Gartner, for example, which they proposed years ago. So big data is data that has huge volume and or any kind of velocity and or any kind of variety to it and in itself any kind of value and hidden value probably so honestly it's just any kind of data we can think of if it's high volumes if it's fast up to real time or even more than real time if it's any kind of structure in our data we talk a lot about unstructured data today which is image data and text data or video data or any kind of uh, semi or unstructured data that's all big data there's no let's say better definition some say big data is what doesn't fit in excel and maybe they are also right and of course we have lots of data so eric schmidt from alphabet said okay there was five exabytes created between the dawn of civilization up to 203 and we did the same uh within two days right now of course we create uh, exabytes or zettabytes or thousands and thousands of terabytes every day and we know all where in all the sensors we have in our social networks and our searches we do and everything we do in the digital internet world because there's data data everywhere and now we want to use them and we want to use them for the better we want to create value out of all this data and for that because it's huge volumes any kind of structure, any kind of velocity attached to it. We need new technologies, we need new skills, we need new paradigms to deal with these amounts of data. And of course, we need new kinds of algorithm to extract real business value. And that's what we talk about when we talk about big data and uh, what kind of systems or services or products we can create. So as I said, data can be structured, unstructured, semi-structured. It can be internal data in your organization. It can be external or open data that you want to add to your data to create new views and maybe a kind of by cross-linking data from different data silos or data sources, create something new out of it. It can be in batch. It can be near time up to real time. And of course, it can be in any kind of infrastructure where the data is located and processed. That's where, for example, a lot of people talk about this kind of data lake, which is just 
kind of new storage paradigm attached to big data, um, which just says, okay, to really work with the data and find new patterns and buy that new value or be able to, to create new use cases and explore all this data, we need to aggregate all of the data first. We have to put them into one place. If it's sensor data, if it's web logs, social media, from searches, from marketing, demographical, transactional, whatever kind of data, ideally we have all this data in one place and can access those data in any kind of way with analytics tools, with machine learning tools, with business intelligence and reporting tools for exploration, for software development, for production ready code and maintenance and operations, everything, everything, everything. The data lake itself is also just a term, maybe a buzzword. And what's underneath it can be a lot of things, can be any kind of database infrastructure it can be cloud-based or on-premise it can be hybrid it can be a lot of different data flows which some are batch processed some are real-time so it really depends on what the data lake is where it is located in your stack what kind of tools and architecture is this lake and by that asset it's only a buzzword but it's really important it's important if you want to work on data to of course create access to all this data give access to everybody who needs it to create new value and how you call it honestly it doesn't really matter so data lake is of course quite a good term for that but you can also talk about data platforms or analytical database just anything goes that's it technology um is needed there's uh, as i said not just new paradigms and new let's say infrastructures you need to think of but of course a lot of new technology out there you can use for uh ingesting data for storing data for working and processing data for um giving access to data for governing data and everything else but technology is often not the real issue because we have a lot of it. So within the last years in the field of big data, a lot of technology got created. A lot of it is open source. You can use, you can play around with. And of course, there's a lot of really, really uh, high class uh, software out there from all the vendors you know uh including new ones which are mainly cloud-based like amazon uh like microsoft azure like google cloud which add technology and technology let's say every week so the real issue is to find out what you really want what you need technology for and then choose the right one that fits your needs and your strategic vision for the next years and then as said, it's there and can be implemented and can be used. Little bit of history. Um, I'm not sure, but some of you uh, might heard about um, Hadoop. Hadoop is um, a big data framework for storing and processing data on distributed systems. So any kind of volume mainly and any kind of structure so mainly unstructured data in high volumes can be processed very, very efficiently uh, with Hadoop. And Hadoop is this funny little elephant, uh, yellow elephant, that is the label or brand of, of Hadoop. And that really got thrown over the fence by Yahoo and Google and others, uh, I think around about 15, maybe even 20 years ago, they actually started about thinking Hadoop and then they implemented it and it was open source and can be used by everyone. And that's great. As said, a lot of the technology we're working with right now is open source and um, a lot of uh, vendors and a lot of players in the market add to this open source stack and to this open source toolkit we can use for, of course, a lot more than 
Google or Facebook or whoever used this piece of technology for originally. So we can, of course, use it for any kind of purpose. And again, what you need to remember is that technology is not our real issue when we talk about big data. It's more about the data and give access to data and work with the data and create something out of it than the technology itself. As I said, we have new, parad new paradigms, sorry. Um, so we're talking about big data. It's a lot about distribution of storage and processing. So compute power, these HDFS MapReduce are um, components and um, of the Hadoop ecosystem I uh, talked about. Um, we can mainly work on commodity machi machines. So it's more about the linear scalability. We don't have to build one big system, one monolithic uh, data warehouse system. It's more about adding uh, a distributed system by using commodity machines. Um, it's always good to keep the data as it is, so in the in, in the raw format, and store it raw, and then work with the data and create any kind of data pool you need to build your service or product on top. Um, for those who are in databases, it, uh, we mainly talk about schema on read here when we work with raw data so we need huge compute power and processing power so it's no no given schema and no schema on write um, it's a lot about exploration of data working with the data not just a waterfall processing software development but a, a lot of agile development agile exploration and it's about something we call data science i come to that in a minute there's option value in big data as well. That means that we might know and might have an idea of a first use case of a primary use of the data we have stored somewhere. So we implement the use cases, but by just keeping the data as it is in the, in the raw and native format, we might find a kind of option value, kind of secondary use later. So um, as there are so many connections between any kind of data source that I add, for example, to my data lake or to my data platform, there's of course a lot of hidden value, option value that I can gain when asking the right questions, having the right ideas, creating new use cases. So what does it mean? Store the data as long as you can in a raw format, Put all the data together, give access to your teams, and then start ideating, as we call it. So find use cases, business cases, and then act in a very agile way on your data and build these products or start ex exploring. That's what big data is all about. Today, one can say big data is mainstream. So it's not really the most innovative field in the world. Uh, right now, we're mainly talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, not about big data. But of course, it's still very complex and always changing on the technological side, but everything around as well. And also, I think very, very clear, it's closely related to cloud because you need these flexible, dynamic, and often very huge platforms and infrastructures which help you to scale easily, to provision system, so processing power and data um, easily, and to give self-service access for any kind of team and any kind of expert level. So a few minutes about data science. What's that? That's many of the people who work with the data, who work not just with big data, but with any kind of data and apply, let's say, analytics on top, apply artificial intelligence on top. Originally, it was defined as an intersection of engineering, math, computer sciences, and hacking that comes from uh, people in the US uh, in 2009, 10, people from Yahoo, Bitly, who said, okay, this is the skill set you need in data science. And these are the really awesome nerds who have all these skills and know about all these intersections. That why it was so damn difficult to find these people. They were called unicorns, the most sexiest job title in the world, and awesome nerds and whatever. But 
of course, this is not really doable. Others added to it and said, okay, data science is more a team sport. We have to have different kind of skill mixes with a so-called T-shaped profile. So everybody knows everything, but they have different in-depth capabilities and skills. Like the data business person, of course, knows more about business, but also knows about programming, machine learning, etc. Same goes for the researcher with a strong focus on mathematics and machine learning probably for the data developer and alike. And by that, and all that stated, it's of course very different to the skill profile uh, and kind of job title we have now in business analytics or business intelligence. But I don't go into details here, it's just when you start working with data, you need a special skill set, which is called data science right now, and you need the people who are able to work with this data and create something new out of it. Kirk Bourne from Bruce Allen has a fantastic definition of what data science is, which I really like. He stated, now's the time to begin thinking of data science as a profession, not a job, as a corporate culture, not a corporate agenda, as a strategy, not a strategy, as a core competency, not a cause, and as a way of doing things, not a thing to do. And the last part is the most important. It is a way of doing things. So it's really, you have to be self-motivated. You, you have to want to work with data as a data scientist to really explore it and find out. And that's what's really all about. At Unbelievable Machine, we created a data science process model, which I also can't go into detail right now. I have a lot more slides to share. And uh, but it just states, okay, data science is a kind of process in the exploration phase in the middle, a very agile process, but it's not something that is, let's say, too chaotic or too explorative. And we can definitely tell you how to do data science, how to initiate data science, how to work with data scientists, and how to get things going. And that's what we see here a little bit just to have a kind of blueprint of how to do data science so that was all i wanted to share today in the introduction about big data and uh, a few thoughts on what is artificial intelligence well right now it's a lot of panic there and i i don't like these gartner hype cycles where they say we are at the peak of inflated expectations i think we are close to the hate of hysteria. Uh, we are kind of panic mode. So AI is everything and it will change the world and it will take all our jobs and it might even kill humanity when they find out that humans are just too stupid to run uh, or work on this world. And that's of course, uh, honestly, and um, sorry for the word, that's bullshit. AI still, if you look on Wikipedia, and I don't read it out loud, um, you can um, get the video later on or the slides as well if you want. And AI is still in research. We really still try to rebuild our human brains. Even we didn't understood the human brains so far. So, but that's still the, the task for researchers is still that. So, and we are not even close. So if we talk about AI today, and if you read about AI today, it's just wrong. We can use the term artificial intelligence, and that is okay, but it's not the AI research that's going on and what people in research think about artificial intelligence. It's something completely different. What we talk about now, when we talk about artificial intelligence is machine learning mainly not all but let's say 85 to 90 percent we talk about machine learning and machine learning is the part and the very prominent part of artificial intelligence it's very well established very well understood it's more like engineering now than research and that's where we can create a lot of things and i will share a few uh, soon and uh, a part of machine learning again is deep learning. And deep learning is 
mainly used when you need to understand unstructured data or work with unstructured data. So if we talk about image detection, image understanding, speech detection, speech translation, video understanding, detection. So all these kind of systems, like when you talk to your Amazon Echo and Amazon Echo understands what you want to say and creates a statement, a kind of search statement out of it. That's all systems that are built with deep learning algorithms, which are multi-layered neural networks. I don't go into detail here. That's not part of an introduction. Um, but that's what really deep learning is about. So you use deep learning for many unstructured data like images, text, audio, video, and you lose machine learning for any kind of other data when you wanna help or help machines to understand or really de detect any kind of pattern in data. Yeah, here it's from Wikipedia what machine learning is. So the most important part is, um, Machine learning explores the study and construction of algorithms that can learn from and make predictions on through building a model from sample inputs. That means we really train an algorithm on existing and known data that is labeled or maybe unlabeled. You call it supervised and unsupervised learning, but we really train the machine on data we know. The machine builds a model out of it. So he understands, he finds and understands the pattern in this data, builds an algorithmic model out of it and can apply this to the real world. That's why it's called machine learning. The machine learns by analyzing patterns in data that we as humans give into this training process. And what can you do? Classification is one of the most prominent and easy to understand examples. So your spam filter, your spam inbox in any kind of mail client is a very, not simple, but it's a classification algorithm. So a machine got trained to understand what is a spam email, what is a not spam email. So for example, you give a thousand spam emails into this uh, algorithm, you give a thousand non-spam emails into this algorithm, the algorithm, the piece of software understands what are the patterns in spam email, what are the patterns in non-spam mails, how do they differ from each other, and by that can create an algorithm that is able to separate spam mails from non-spam mails. And that's what you call a classification. It's a very, very broad area to actually um, build a lot of products from wherever you want to classify data in different buckets um which uh let's say have uh, millions of different features in it and data points you use machine learning same goes if you want to de detect things for example in anomaly detection in any kind of uh, industry context where you want to monitor your machines and want to detect any kind of things that are not the normal then you can use machine learning Segmentation clustering, we know from marketing or any kind of user group modeling in your customer relationship management, for example, or in any kind of data, you use clustering algorithms, which are part of machine learning, which is unsupervised learning. Recommender, we know it all from Amazon, from Netflix, so any kind of recommendation engine got trained on data, on user behavior, on user preferences, and an algorithm can learn these patterns and apply them and build a kind of list of recommendations for, let's say, an e-commerce business. It's also machine learning that we already know. Prediction very prominent. A lot of people are into this now, predictive analytics, to um, make a machine um, be able to, um, to do predictions. You use machine learning models. And of course, you need data to learn from. And then for, yeah, look, look with these knowledge into the future of the data, for example. And yes, do predictions. You all know what I mean. 
as said, with a machine learning, in this case, deep learning, you are able to understand better images, videos, audio, text, if it's speech understanding in Amazon Echo, if it's video understanding, for example, in autonomous driving, it's a, if it's image detection, for example, finding faces or any kind of objects on images, we know it, for example, from Facebook and other social networks, it's all machine learning, in this case, deep learning, so it's all a use case or let's say a usage scenario to apply artificial intelligence, well, machine learning, to mainly big data and create a new service. And creation, which uh, happens lately, um, the last few uh, months, let's say uh, this year, that of course you can also use machine learning models and algorithms to create things. In this case, for example, art, but it can be any kind of thing. Yeah, you can. You might have seen these um, services and these applications where you can transfer one style of an image to another one. For example, you make a picture of your little daughter or your little son and apply a filter from Van Gogh or any kind of other famous painter to it. And then you can apply the style of Van Gogh images and paintings, not images, to your personal images and they look like Van Gogh paintings, for example. It's all machine learning, all kind of things you can do. And here, for example, how um, machine learning, in this case, deep learning works. It's a two-stage process. First of all, you train the network. You see it at the top. So you know all your data. You know this is data about uh, dogs and cats and a lot of other animals. You run a training process and the model learns to better and better work on these training examples. And when you're ready with the training, you can deploy the neural network or any kind of algorithm to your production system. And if a new image, in this case, a cat image comes into your service, it runs through and it gets ideally detected as a cat. I can't go into details. If you are really interested in the details right now, this is what you have to look for on Google. Jason Mays, Machine Learning 101. It's just a couple of days old, I think. It went all over the internet and Twitter, Facebook, everybody shared it. It's a really fantastic introduction for everybody into machine learning. So I think really everybody can understand it. There are a few videos included, which are amazing, which really tell you how neural networks work. And I'm sure you will understand, everybody will understand. It's really fantastic. There's the link underneath, it's quite long because it's a Google Doc presentation. But if you Google for Jason Mays, Machine Learning 101, you definitely find this slide deck. And he said you need two hours. And I honestly say, take these two hours and go through this presentation and it really adds to what I say today and you get a better understanding of everything that's algorithm machine learning today. Really awesome, do it. Okay, all that said, we talked about data, we talked about algorithms, analytics, AI, um, but honestly, that's not all. You can't do everything you want. You can't solve any kind of problem just with, let's say, big data or artificial intelligence. We need more. So to really be able to work as an organization with data, algorithms, any kind of related technologies, there's a lot more you need to think of, you need to, to work on. And that's, of course, everything that's surrounding technology and surrounding data and algorithms. So we talk organizational structures here, we talk about skills here, we talk about routines, culture, which is a very fuzzy word. We talk about leadership, community. So to really enable yourself, there's a lot more capabilities you need to think of that needs to be assessed, understood, and to be worked on, and to really create a kind of strategy how you as an organization, as a company, want to go on with this, yeah, let's say digital transformation. So how do you want to transform yourself or your business models or create new business models with probably data and artificial intelligence? How? As said, it's a lot more. We call it data thinking, where you should start. 
the first skill that you need. And we created the framework around, which we call data leadership process model. I can't go into the details. There's a white paper out. I share the link to it uh, later. And that just means, okay, you, data thinking means you have to understand, you have to sense everything that's happening out there. You have to have a deep understanding in IT, but also on the business side. What is big data really about? How do I as an organization in, with my customers, with my products, have to think about data today and tomorrow? Do I need to think about artificial intelligence now? And how? What does it mean? What kind of use cases can I think of? All these kind of things. And then you start creating in a very, very agile way. For us, it's three cycles with different speeds. There's an idea creation cycle to create new ideas for use cases, for potential business value. There's the solution creation cycle using new technologies, the data, new algorithm with the skills in your organization, new tools to create things step by step by step, adding technology, use cases, capabilities to your organization and overall become a digital leader in your market or just for yourself and also step by step add to your digital maturity and add to what you might or others call your transformation. I don't really like the word. I prefer the word, let's say, uh, maturity. So you need to add to your maturity when it comes to data, artificial intelligence and everything related. I have a few more minutes. And then feel free to ask some questions. Um, I hope you get a decent understanding and the first, first, really first understanding of what uh, big data is about. That it's mainly really about the data and the access to the data. If it's a lake, if it's a platform, whatever. Then in comes the algorithms and uh, everything that's called machine learning, artificial intelligence, advanced analytics, whatever, that's really the engine. That's the engine running on this fuel. And the fuel is the data. So you have to have the fuel first and then you build the engines. And with these engines, you drive a lot of new services, you enhance services you already have, you build new products, new insights, of course, into your customer base, into your processes, your markets, whatever. And by that, one by one, add to your digital maturity and yes, transform yourself. That's what it's all about, really, quite a lot, honestly. Um, but what's coming next? There's a few thoughts I want to share with you. Labs and factories. I think if you really start just now, there are a few things you should think about. The first is have a first understanding of where are you right now? Build a foundation, a foundation of, okay, what does it mean when we as our company, our organizations, think about big data and artificial intelligence. Where are we right now? Where are the potential? What kind of business value can we leverage? What's in it for us? And when you have this foundation, then a lot of companies start building something they call lab, kind of data lab, a kind of seed, a new team, a new small unit in the organization, maybe the IT innovation teams or the IT organization or anywhere else and start exploring, start learning, start creating. Use partners, get up to speed. As I said, learn quite a lot, fail also. Work in an agile mode and just get things going. And after that, that's what we experience right now. Labs move into something that some call factories. So how do you bring everything you learned, all the use cases, the lighthouses you created into production, make them work 24 seven on any kind of infrastructure. And that's of course, another step to take afterwards. Or if you already have a lot lab, which you might think of now and uh, which we, for example, can support. Another topic, next big thing, um, some call it white box AI. 
Um, that means a lot of the algorithms, especially neural networks and deep neural networks right now are kind of black box. So it's really difficult to understand how any decision took place inside this algorithm. So um, it's really difficult to use these kind of systems in uh, very sensitive environments, like for example, autonomous cars, or even when it comes to privacy and these kind of things like the GDPR, GDPR uh, topic um, we all experience now. Um, so we of course need to paint these black boxes white. Uh, it's called explainable artificial intelligence. It's a lot of research going on. It's a mathematical and technological issue. Also, of course, a governance issue. And that's where a lot of companies actually think about right now, how can they get a grip on that? Citizen data science is a word uh, for more and more self-service when it comes to data and let's say applied analytics on top of data. Of course, if you build now all these data lakes, data platform, if we give access to all the data and are able to explore the data with new kind of tools, with new kind of paradigms, it of course makes sense to also open up these new capabilities to business users and to people who are not that experienced in data science or data engineering. So let's say the normal business user and some call those citizen data science. So that's also what we see, what is needed for any kind of data-driven enterprise in the future to let everybody work with the data whenever it is relevant for him. And um, that's of course also more than technology is an organizational, a cultural thing. And of course we need the right tools, the right governance, uh, rights and role management, whatever you wanna call it. Next, we see a huge industrialization of AI, especially on public cloud platforms. So it's uh, not just the classical IaaS on uh, cloud systems or PaaS, it's a lot more software as a service or even service as a service. Um, and uh, that's what I also talked about when I said big data gets mainstream, um, artificial intelligence, better machine learning gets mainstream as well next year. But of course, you still need to understand what you do. Consumerization, I think that's uh, pretty uh, clear and pretty easy to understand for everybody. Um, it's about that, of course, a, a lot more um, intelligent products or products and services that include any kind of uh, machine learning or AI uh, go to the market everywhere. One example, Amazon Echo, and we as uh, individuals and as companies with our employees maybe and of course as a society have to deal with that edge computing is a trend you heard about so everything that's also internet of things we didn't talk about today but internet of things produces a lot of data so it's a lot of unstructured unstructured semi-structured data in any kind of velocity any kind of volume so it's big data by itself produced at the edges in any kind of things and so we need to think about new kind of architecture. So where gets data processed? Not just maybe at the back end, because it's sometimes difficult to get all the huge amounts of data from any kind of device to a back end. So we need to also analyze data and even apply machine learning on the data at the edges itself. And some call it federated learning. That's what Google talks about, but it's already started, uh, but it's very early stage. Hybrid, of course, hybrid cloud, one of the big topics of base farm, besides uh, information security and big data AI. Um, it's, of course, a topic, as I said, big data needs uh, huge infrastructures, a lot of resources, ideally on demand and everywhere, uh, including Internet of Things and Edge. And then, of course, it makes sense to think cloud, but not just public cloud, but think hybrid, to be aware of which data you you hold on your on-premise infrastructures, you work on because it's your USP or it's very sensitive data and which other data sources and data pools and any kind of analytics on top can you uh, put into the cloud and create any kind of multi or hybrid context. And yes, it's about Agile, uh, Zalando calls it radical agility. Um, if you Google for radical agility, 
Zalando on YouTube, you find very impressive videos about how Zalando works and organizes their teams and everything. And that's also something that we will see in the future more and more. Last statement. The real revolution is not in machines, as said, that calculate data, so also not in data, but in data and how we use it. So please, whenever you talk about big data or machine learning or whatever, start to think in business cases and use cases first, create ideas, what do you want to achieve, create a strategy, a solid foundation, and then build your capabilities in data and AI and everything related as I already showed and then i think you're on a very good way to become a more and more mature data enterprise thank you very much uh, this is the white paper i talked about about data thinking and this data leadership process model it gives you a little bit more detail about how we as unbelievable machine and as base farm can support your yeah your individual process or progress into the digital age when it comes to data artificial intelligence when it comes to cloud computing hybrid infrastructures and when it comes to everything else um, that we as base farm uh, stand for at the market and thank you very much that's from me thank you so much class uh, really interesting um... I have a question uh, for myself. Uh, you had a quote about bringing data science and making it a corporate culture. Uh, with your experience and um, everything, how should you make that happen? Do you have like any short tips uh, in how to do it? I think if you really start with it today, with uh, everything I talked about, with these new paradigms and data and algorithms and technologies and everything, as said, it, it, it's good to create a kind of foundation. We call it foundation at Base Farm, and which is a, a set of different workshops to actually support companies to yeah set a solid foundation to start. So you get a better understanding of what it really is. We assess where you are right now. We create together a first strategic vision of where you might head to, what could be first use cases. We identify those as well and by that have a first starting point. But it all really starts with a kind of new understanding and yeah. a new foundation. And then you add to it and it's a, it's a very lean. It's a, it's, a, it's a very lean and very, very simple start. It's a, it's a couple of workshops, let's say 10 days workshop to set a solid foundation in every aspect. And then we can add to it by adding use cases, a piece of technology here, create a first lighthouse project, um, give you a detailed, uh, let's say, executive training on what can you do and what can't you do with machine learning, and so on and so on. It's a very, very modular and lean approach. Mm. And it depends on where you are right now. Yeah, OK. That's good. Uh, we don't have any questions uh, at the moment from oh, the God. listeners. Um, I could have spent six minutes more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could have. Uh, but as I said, uh, I mean, um, you can email us if you have any questions, uh, and we will send you the link to this uh, recording afterwards. And we will also send you the link to the white paper that Klaus uh, talked about. Ah, we have um, we have questions. <laughs> uh, is uh, GDPR going to have an impact on big data? um for sure I think you mentioned uh, gdpr yes. Yeah. yes um honestly i am not the gdpr expert at uh, base farm an unbelievable machine but of course yes um uh, on the data side it's also has an impact that it uh, um you really have to think about where and how do you store and and work with data and how do you handle master data management um, you all every kind of thing that you need today in master data management gets even let's say more complicated uh, when it comes to big data and even more complicated talking about gdpr so yes it has a, a, a deep impact 
And uh, so if you are um, have to think about a GDPR strategy, um, you, you should also think about your data strategy. Um, the other is, as I said, uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence, um, a lot of the decisions these systems make, especially when it comes to neural networks, which is um, everything in deep learning, for example, right now, um, they don't explain themselves. So, so the decision making in inside these uh, algorithms is uh, not transparent and uh, it, it can't explain itself. So whenever you need to uh, tell your client why a specific decision has been made, um, and that's part of the GDPR context, then you won't be able to apply any algorithm you want, but you have to choose which kind of algorithm and which gives you the explainability and transparency you need for GDPR. So it has a, it has an impact on both. Yeah, that's a good, um, yeah, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for this uh, presentation class. Uh, and I wish you all a continuous uh, great day. Thank you. Goodbye, yeah, everyone. Thank you. Bye.